So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the library at Campion Hall here in Oxford, both to those gathered here in person and those of you joining us online. This evening, I think we have a real treat delayed from uh, last term due to illness. Uh, St. Robert Southall and his readers by Professor Peter Davidson. Uh, Peter, as many of you know, is a senior research fellow in Renaissance and Baroque studies here at Campion Hall. He's also the curator of our art collection. He teaches in the English faculty and is published in, in a number of different areas, but especially in uh, uh, the kind of area that we're looking at tonight. And we don't really have a better guide to uh, to looking at Robert Southall than, than Peter, who's the general editor of a major project with Oxford University Press to publish the complete works of uh, Robert Southall in five volumes. So a significant thing, including works that have never been published before. So that's a really um, exciting uh, project that Peter's leading. And uh, we're going to get a taste of some of the fruits of his research this evening, where he's really going to delve in, I think, uh, into uh, the sort of mystery about uh, Robert Southall's disappearance from the canon, uh, given his merits as a writer, given uh, his early popularity. And uh, I'm hoping for some enlightenment. As certainly he's not unknown, and there's a, a welcome... Uh, a burgeoning of literature about Southall again at the moment uh, to which Peter is, has contributed uh, but it will be uh, hoping for some light on uh, what happens to uh, Robert Southall's poetry especially in the canon. Uh, those of you online are welcome to uh, enter questions and we'll, we'll be able to uh, offer those to Peter to answer after the talk. And uh, the talk will be about 45 minutes. We'll wrap everything up around 6.45 p.m. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so once again, I should have mentioned I'm Nick Austin. I'm the master of the hall, uh, master of Campion Hall and a Jesuit priest. And I'm, it's a personal uh, pleasure for me to introduce this talk because I've loved Robert Southall's writing since my early 20s. And so to have Peter uh, enlighten us and open up Robert Southall's uh, writings and his significance for us this evening is, uh, is a real delight. So over Nick. to you, Peter. Nick, thank you so much. What was John Monk Milton reading on the afternoon of the 30th of October, 1638? I think I can offer an informed guess point to a possible source for Paradise Lost that has escaped notice, and lay before you a genuine enigma in the history of English literature. Now, we know that Milton was in Rome on that day, and that he dined in company at the Venerable English College in the Via di Monserrato. Surprising as it may be to discover the fiercely Protestant Milton in exiled Catholic company, in the earlier 17th century, the comparatively rare Protestant travellers to Rome from England tended to seek out their exiled Catholic countrymen, having few alternatives for company or for local introductions. Milton's name and the, name of his, the names of his fellow visitors are recorded in the manuscript register known as the Pilgrim Book, still at the college. The investigations of Gordon Campbell and Thomas Corns have shown that the poet is the only possible Dominus Milton to have been in Rome on that day. His companions were expatriate Catholic aristocrats, nobilis angli. All were magnificently received in the college. The party was literary and scholarly. One member, Patrick Carey, 1624-57, would later compose sacred verse in Latin and light verse in English. The party also included Sir Nicholas Fortescue, 1605 to 44, an alumnus of the English Jesuit College at St. Omer's, which had a rich tradition of Latin oratory and Latin drama. Indeed, one of the St. Omer's plays, Mercia by Joseph Simmons, with its hermit magician dwelling deep in the oak woods of England, 
offers a haunting series of resemblances to Milton's Comus, which was first performed in Ludlow in 1634. Now, by the time of his visit to Rome, Milton had won renown not only for this vernacular mask, but also for elegant and memorable Latin verses, including a 1626 poem on the gunpowder plot, complete with descriptions of infernal caves and their rebellious inhabitants. After dinner, the magnificent reception accorded to the visitors would presumably have extended to a tour of the college buildings, including the chapel with its harrowing wall paintings of the martyrs, whose blood had been shed for the church in England through the centuries from St Alban onwards. This sequence had been begun to a considerable degree as a response to the news of the martyrdom of St Edmund Campion and his companions on the 1st of December 1581. It seems extremely likely that Milton and the other guests would also have visited the library. We know that in that library there was a manuscript collection, now bound, of the choicest verses and orations made by its students. The earliest entries dating from the 1580s, with additions still being made at the time of Milton's visit. And Milton was, after all, in company with two Catholics, thoroughly versed in contemporary Latin. Now, that collection survives in the college to this day, catalogued as Liber 281. In it, on pages 132 to 138, is a substantial Latin poem by Robert Southall, um, 1561 to 1595, Poema di Assumptio Nibiati Maria Virginis, which exhibits striking parallels with the opening two books of Paradise Lost. In this epic in miniature, Southall praises the Blessed Virgin with Baroque ingenuity. Since she is sinless, Southall argues, she is exempt from the power of death. The poem describes the rabid, furious response of a personified death and her infernal allies to this realisation. It begins with a description of creation and moves swiftly on to Paradise and its loss by the way of the temptations of the fallen Lucifer who brings into being sin and death. Death is the protagonist of the poem from here on. She summons an assembly in the terrifying caverns under the earth, where she rules over her infernal court from a squalid throne. Um, urged by old age, who urges moderation, the company are persuaded to seek a judgment rather than to rebel outright. A messenger flies upwards, puts the case of the Senate of Lethe to the celestial court, but God rules in favour of one exceptional woman. The Blessed Virgin is crowned Queen of Heaven, and death flees back to the underworld. Now, might it be reasonable to conjecture that Milton saw Savile's Latin poem on that day in Rome, and that his biblical epic was influenced by this early work by the Jesuit poet and martyr? Interestingly, two months after his visit to Rome, Milton wrote in Naples, in his poem Mansus, that he was meditating on a historical subject for an epic poem. He may indeed have been prompted by Southall's poem, with its brilliant dramatisation of an infernal conclave and an attempted rebellion against God. We can be certain that at least one copy of Southall's poem was under the same roof as Milton on that afternoon, and we might indeed conjecture that on the afternoon of the 30th of October, 1638, Milton was reading Southall. This anecdote raises the central question which this lecture hopes to address. How can we be so certain that the name Robert Southall would leap off the page to Milton's eye? Quite simply, in the first quarter of the 17th century, his name and work would have been inevitably familiar to anyone who cared at all for poetry in English. Southall's work was already famous by the time of Milton's visit. In the early 17th century, his vernacular verses had outsold those of every contemporary except Shakespeare. His most popular prose work was frequently reprinted as well. In 1591, the stationer Gabriel Corwood issued under the hand of the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury Southall's prose meditation, Mary Magdalene's Funeral Tears. This proceeded to run through seven subsequent editions in London up to 1636. 
In the year of Southall's execution, 1595, six editions of his works appeared alone in London. In all, Southall's various works went through at least 20 editions in London between the years 1591 and 1636, and through at least two Edinburgh and five continental editions as well. These facts were all mustered by Louis Marx in the Poetry of Meditation in the 50s. I think I need to emphasise this. Southall was, at the turn of the 17th century, the most printed and reprinted contemporary English language poet, save the Shakespeare of Venus and Adonis. Yet even now, Southall has to some degree vanished from the canon and has almost vanished too from the history of English literature. I'm coordinating an attempt to edit his complete works, but hitherto only his verse and a few small prose works have received scholarly editions. Astonishingly, his immensely popular meditation, Mary Magdalene's Funeral Tears, exists in a modern edition only on my hard drive and on those of my fellow editors of the Oxford University Press Southall. What I hope to show in the course of this talk is that Southall seems to have vanished or been vanished by the time when English literature was becoming as established as a subject for university study. This disappearance was partly, I suspect, a radical simplification of a truly complex narrative. But I will also argue that this removal of the popular and influential Southall from the canon and from history reflects early 20th century ideas, which are in part nationalistic and sectarian, hostile to the any idea of internationalism or an international republic of letters. Why so? I suppose if the prestige of the vernacular is even questioned, if influence from outside England is admitted, English primacy, as the curriculum is formed, and the status of Shakespeare and Dunn are also questioned, and these questions are altogether too uncomfortable to explore, which seems a very good reason indeed to explore them. Well, I will first look quite briefly at Southall's recusant Catholic readers and the specific, sometimes remarkable use which they made of his verses. My main subject this evening is the vast majority of Southall's readers, which is to say his Anglican and Presbyterian readers, those who bought and used copies of the many licensed and freely available London and Edinburgh editions of his works. I hope to show that Southall was read very widely indeed in various Protestant communities, and that his wide and sustained popularity with Protestant readers casts very serious doubts on much which has been written about confessional reading, confessional style, and indeed about confessional spirituality. It certainly negates completely the extremely strange argument, which I saw last advanced last year, that only recusant Catholics read Southall and therefore he couldn't possibly have influenced Protestant writers. But indeed he is likely to have inf influenced those Protestants who bought copies of 18 licensed and entered London printings of his works. There are in fact also two rogue London printings, um, very Catholic indeed, hiding in plain sight, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, once someone has vanished from a literary history, it is fascinating to observe just how difficult it is to reinstate them. Really much of what I have to say is a restatement with variations of what has been said half a century ago and more by the late Professor Louis Marx of Yale, and then revised, revisited and brilliantly expanded at the beginning of this century by my dear friend Professor Alison Schell. Both of these scholars emphasise the pivotal role which Southall played in the development of early modern English poetry as the single poet who did most to bring international styles in devotional verse to a country in some way moving out of the mainstream of international currents in the arts. In his wonderful The Poetry of Meditation, published in 1954 and revised in 1962, Marx emphasises the degree to which Southall can be considered the founder of the whole school of meditative, 
meditative but also effective and visually imagined religious verse in 17th century England. When English became established as a subject for university study in the early 20th century, Dunn was of course rapidly advanced as the most significant innovator in poetry of the early modern period in England. To have placed Dunn as a poet who was innovative within a tradition begun by an English Jesuit educated on the continent would have complicated a narrative as well as perhaps opening some uncomfortable questions. So to quote Marx, in short, the present study attempts to modify the view of literary history which sees a done tradition in English religious poetry. It suggests instead a meditative tradition, which found its first notable exponent not in Donne, but in Robert Southall. Such a tradition could explain a number of embarrassing problems, which cannot be adequately explained, with Donne alone as our basing point. This is in no way to deny the greatness or the great influence of Donne on the course of English poetry, but only to argue that a broader and greater tradition lies behind the abundant variety and versatility of English religious poetry in the 17th century. So, now I will move to Southall's Catholic readers. Let us look to this minority, to Southall's readers, English recusant Catholics at home or abroad. Um, they were presumably the first readers, but certainly not the only readers, by any means, in Southall's mind, when he composed his English verses. And they seem to have had access to his vernacular poems in manuscript three or four years before a selection of those poems were first printed in London in 1595, the year of Southall's death. I do apologise, this is my faintest slide. The ink of this manuscript has faded quite considerably. That is actually the first witness to the text of The Burning Babe. The nearest thing to an archetype or a, an authorial manuscript to survive is the substantial Jesuit-owned and Jesuit-copied manuscript collection of Southall's English poems, which is on paper watermarked 1592 and was once in the hands of the Waldegrave family. It is now in the Jesuit archives and is known as Stonyhurst Manuscript A26. This is in two hands, there's a scribal hand and there's a very scrupulous correcting hand. It looks as if it's one remove from an autograph archetype. Um, after this, there are further manuscripts in the same textual tradition clearly circulated clandestinely in the Catholic community. The celebrated Bodleian manuscript English poet B5 comes to mind, as does the Gordon Castle manuscript in the National Library of Scotland. Texts closely related to this Catholic manuscript textual tradition were printed in five continental editions, starting with the St. Omer's printing of 1616, which included both St. Peter's Complaint and Mary Magdalene's Funeral Tears. Um, this is a very explicitly Catholic collection, almost certainly for clandestine distribution. But there is a startling exception to, to this pattern. The 1590s London volume, titled Moinonie, is clearly seeking a Catholic audience and attempting to circulate in the London market simply by a strategy of hiding in plain sight. There were two editions of Minonier, most usually, um, sorry, um, there were two editions of Minonier, both printed by Valentine Sims for John Busby in 1595, and a second edition also dated 1595, but the short title catalogue thinks 1599, a much more likely date for the later issue. Now, the title itself is extremely obscure and ingenious in the illusion which it makes. It is the kind of subtle, half-hidden analogy which is the staple of Jesuit encodement and also of kind of analogical English Jesuit historical drama. If you decode that illusion, it at once identifies the author and creates an audacious allegorical reading of an episode in Ovid. Mononia, genitive of Mononia, most usually written Maonia, means of Lydia or of the parts around Lydia. 
but the form Myonia is found in Renaissance editions of Book 3 of Ovid's Metamorphoses, at lines 572 onwards, when the raging King Pentheus's men capture Acotes the Menonian, a priest of Bacchus, and drag him bound before the king. The Latin text is up on the slide. So the guards say, we have captured a companion of his, a priest of his sacred rites, to whom King Pentheus says, O you who are about to die, and by your death teach others a lesson. Tell me your name and your country, and why you follow the customs of this new religion. And Acotes answers without fear that he is a Myonian, and says, Ili metu vacus, nomin mihi dixit Acotes, Patriae Myonia est. He has been miraculously converted to the worship and priesthood of Bacchus. He is hauled away to a dungeon and torture. In fact, his prison flies open and he escapes, and it is the king who condemned him who dies the horrible death. This, is 15, this 1590s elusive reading is unequivocally oppositional. It reminds me actually very strongly of the fragmentary biblical quotations on Sir Thomas Tresham's 1593 Triangular Lodge, that the more you explore the context of the quotation, the more oppositional they become. In this reading, the cult of Bacchus is Catholicism, Achates is the Mononian, is Southall, and Mad King Pentheus, torn limb from limb, is Queen Elizabeth. Having discovered this, this whole freight of meaning in a one-word title, the claim which follows on the title page is clearly nothing but a smokescreen, implying legality, hiding behind the London editions of St Peter's Complaint, attempting in short to hide in plain sight. Myonia claims to contain certain spiritual poems and hymns omitted in the last edition of Peter's Complaint, being needful thereunto to be annexed as being both divine and witty, all composed by Mr. R.S. It is actually an explicitly Roman Catholic collection. It begins with the sequence of meditative poems on the lives of Mary and Jesus, which occur at the beginning of the Catholic family of manuscripts, and contains the translation of the Corpus Christi hymn, Lauda Zion Salvatorem. The explicitly Marian and Eucharistic poems gathered here were unlikely to pass for reform devotion, even if Southall's very beautiful but very dangerous poem on Mary, Queen of Scots, Decease, Release, which is present in all the Catholic manuscripts, is here omitted. Locally in Oxford, it seems to me particularly interesting that there's a copy of Myonia in the Library of Jesus College, a Reformation Foundation chartered by Queen Elizabeth, that is, allegorically, King Pentheus. So I would like to turn now to the use which two recusant Catholic women, readers of Southall, one in the 16th and one in the 17th century, how they read, absorbed and transformed Southall's poems in their own work. Elizabeth Grimston's Miscellanea, Meditations, Memoratives, was released posthumously in 1604, the year after her death. She had been born in Norfolk, a distant kinswoman of well, sorry, a distant kinswoman of the Southalls in 1563. Her book is a mother's testament, the work of an unhappy recusant at odds with her Anglican birth family, and contains in chapter 11 a set of meditations on sin and forgiveness, weaving in and out of Southall's St Peter's complaint, borrowing and varying Southall's words in changing patterns of perspective on redemption and Christ's mercy. She gives a real sense of having internalised Southall's poem, which she used to recite, according to her son, presumably mentally, while playing, presumably she played a tune associated with the words, on a wind instrument, probably a recorder. I will say no more here about her in that this work has been so well investigated by Alison Shell, whose research I acknowledge with sincere gratitude. And now I will turn to the recusant gentlewoman, Helena Winter of Badge Court, designer and maker with her atelier of Worcestershire Catholic gentlewomen of extraordinary vestments, all with some personal element of iconography and invention, all worked in shimmering bullion thread 
pearls and gems. Their aesthetic value is very high, and her works are one of the most substantial oeuvres in any visual medium which can be securely attributed to a named early modern Englishwoman. Now, Helena Winter, who lived from about 1600 to 1671, was the daughter of the executed gunpowder plotter Robert Winter. She never married and devoted her life and considerable family resources to the support of the Jesuit mission and to the manufacture of vestments and altar hangings for the society. The iconographies of these works are complex and appear to be the fruit of individual or group meditation. There is a clear sense that her atelier was also a religious gathering for daily meditation and prayer. Here again I want to acknowledge a friend and fellow scholar. The thoughts which follow were very, very much developed with Janet Graffius, curator at Stonyhurst of half the winter textiles and curator of the exhibition of them at Auckland Castle. It was already established that mm, oh, I'm lost. It was already established that much of the imagery on the winter vestments was derived from a book of Hortulan meditations, Partenia Sacra, by the English Jesuit Henry Hawkins, published at Rouen in 1633. Thus also, it was established that the designs were in no sense freestanding aesthetic inventions, but embodiments of digested religious meditation. Alerted by the recurrence of the images of pheasant and phoenix and pelican, sorry, the images of phoenix and pelican, we realised that Southall's poem, Christ's Bloody Sweat, was also a text on which the Wintour Atelier had meditated. The digested presence of this text appears in the winter white dalmatic and tunical which you've seen, both refashioned from a single white antipendium. It is also hauntingly present in the chasuble referred to in Winter's Will as the spangled suit, which is what you're looking at now. So Jan and I first set our, our ideas about the Winter Atelier meditating on Southall. We set these forth in our joint Parsons lecture at Stonyhurst, Secret Southall. Christ's Bloody Sweat is a strange meditative poem, audaciously Baroque in its progressions of thought. The first square, the first stanza which you see, is a magic square of phrases which can be read horizontally or vertically, or because this is a very good magic square, diagonally. And it evokes Christ sweating blood and water in the Garden of Gethsemane. Fat soil, full spring, sweet olive, grape of bliss, that yields, that streams, that pours, that doth distill untilled, undrawn, unstamped, untouched of press, dear fruit, clear brooks, fair oil, sweet wine at will. Thus Christ, unforced, prevents in shedding blood the whips, the thorns, the nails, the spear and rood. But the poem goes on to evoke the way in which this is a prefiguring event, Christ himself encompassing the fates of Pelican and Phoenix, but here the syntax of the second stanza is ambiguous and could refer also to the agony of an imitator of Christ and it does so in terms which more than touch upon the hideous deaths of the martyrs on the English mission. As Jan Graffius phrases it, Helena chose to depict the pelicans and phoenixes which appear in her work beside streams of water, symbols of blood, fire, sacrifice and resurrection, references to the deaths of the Catholic priests in whose executions both fire and water were employed. He pelicans, he phoenix fate doth prove, whom flames consume, whom streams enforce to die. How burneth blood, how bleedeth burning love, can one in flame and stream both bathe and fry. How could he join a phoenix fiery pains in fainting pelicans still bleeding veins? The white antipendium had pelican and phoenix, and the pelican by water appears also on the white vestment which you've seen with small gilded brilliance called the spangled suit. 
This vestment has a prominent Marian monogram within a sunburst, flowers from Parthenia Sacra, which relate symbolically to the attributes of Our Lady, marigold, iris, rose. And it also has small sunbursts containing the Jesuit IHS and the monograms of St Ignatius and Francis Xavier. The sword-pierced heart of the Virgin is above the pelican, and at bottom left is a red flower, quite hard to identify, which at various times Jan and I have thought might be, indeed must be, a rose campion. If so, Helena Winter's thoughts followed the same sequence of ours as she read Christ's bloody sweat, and the canting flower evokes the martyr, imitator of Christ, pelican and phoenix, St Edmund Campion. This leads naturally to a, a brief consideration of an exceptional category of Catholic reader of Southall, which is to say the martyrologists of the late 17th century, who gathered and preserved Southall autographs and scribal copies of works by Southall as they assembled evidence for the eventual process of his canonization. Um, the canonization of the English martyrs was not in fact formally opened until the later 19th century. The chief animator in this, in, in this enterprise of gathering so Southall's writings as testimony was the English Jesuit Father Christopher Green. You see his handwriting on the, on the flyleaf here who seems to have concentrated Southall material, mostly brought from Rome, amongst extensive collections relating to English Jesuit martyrs at the Bibliotheca Magna, and you see on the inside of the front board, Bib Mag, um, of the English College in Liège. He annotated his intervention and intention on this title page, a pamphlet now in the Bodleian, as you see here, and you see also the library mark of, down the bottom, of the Bibliotheca Magna of Liège. Much of this manuscript material, including the very first draft of St Peter's Complaint, this is now at Stonyhurst, was brought from Rome, or certainly the watermarks of the Chigi Montes and the Pamphili Dove would suggest that these are Roman, this is Roman paper. Um, this was brought from Rome and while the greater part of the Liège libraries and collections were brought to England, um, Liège is a river port, it was not impossible to get a lot of material out. When the Napoleonic armies arrived in the bishopric of Liège, they plundered the Jesuit college with the spite which they reserved for British establishments on the continent. And they scattered those manuscripts which hadn't been got out, those manuscripts remaining there, which we can conjecture, sadly, must in fact have formed a reserve of the most important works. This explains the scattered leaves in Southall's hand, which are now in the Bodleian, and the lost manuscript of plays from St Omer's, which Stonyhurst bought on the antiquarian market only a few years ago. In fact, the Napoleonic armies appear to have created a paper chase of Liège reserve manuscripts stretching across Europe. It is my hope to pass my declining years in following it. So let us turn to consider Southall and those between confessions. So here is an early version of the Jesuit badge as painted up in a not particularly secret Catholic chapel in Aberdeen. Before passing to the Protestant majority of early modern readers of Southall, I'd like to pause for a moment on those who might be seen as moving between confessions in an early modern lifetime. Of those, the exiled Scot and accomplished minor poet Simeon Graham, 1570 to 1614, is perhaps interesting to us only in that Southall seems to dominate his poetic and moral imagination. He lived a wandering life, he converted to Catholicism, he contributed a sonnet to Elizabeth Grimston's published Miscellanea, he may have died a Franciscan in France. His book, The Passionate Spark of a Relenting Mind, London 1604, especially his verse, his Passionado when he was in pilgrimage, is intensely intertextual with St Peter's complaint and with Southall's mountain poem, A Veil of Tears. It echoes other poems of Southall's as well, 
the prodigal child's soul rack, and also the shipwreck imagery of St Peter's complaint. I touch on this minor writer only in that his whole poetic of reckoning with conscience finds its voice exclusively through the work of Southall. From him, I move to a very major writer indeed, the most celebrated literary convert of the period, John Donne. I am most indebted to Peter McCulloch for drawing my attention to an extraordinary moment when the then Protestant and ordained Donne, in a baptism sermon of 1615 to 17, seems to draw attention to Southall's most popular works in the course of a strange passage which implies that some godparents of the Anglican child being baptised were in fact recusant Catholics. The whole passage is intensely Southwellian in that it deals with repentant tears, with cleansing waters, with God, God wiping away all tears. I quote, Whether they be tears of compunction or tears of compassion, tears for ourselves or tears for other, whether they be Magdalene's tears or Peter's tears, or tears for the state, that penal laws pecuniary or bloody lie heavy upon you, Deus substergit omnem lacrimam. As an epilogue to this section, it is agreeable to note in the one city in Britain which might be described as confessionally plural, which is to say Aberdeen, with its three-century policy of pragmatic toleration, Southall's Mary Magdalene's complaint makes a very late appearance in the astonishingly miscellaneous songbook Songs and Fancies, produced by the Episcopalian poet and publisher John Forbes in 1682. It seems to me wholly likely that he intended that Southall's yearning verses um, um, should be read in different modes by different confessions in the plural city. With my love, my life was nestled in the sum of happiness. From my love, my life is rested to a world of heaviness. O oh, let love my life remove, sith I live not where I love. My own thought is that that kind of plurality is potentially present in the text from its composition. Southall was, above all, a generous poet. Moving out of the shadow worlds of the gens lucifugia and of those between religious confessions, we come to those of Southall's work which circulated absolutely openly on the London market, clearly attended for a majority Anglican readership. The several editions of St Peter's Complaint and associated poems are composed of works which are essentially scriptural in matter and consolatory in tone. Perhaps they are unusually visual and effective by the English standards of the turn of the 17th century, but being founded on scripture or being exhortations to virtue, they were clearly acceptable to all religious sensibilities. This was the collection which was much reprinted at London and indeed at Edinburgh. Some editions also contain Mary Magdalene's Funeral Tears, which is itself scriptural and also consolatory. These St Peter's Complaint editions could command a wide and untroubled readership and enjoyed vast popularity in Reformed Britain, both Anglican and Presbyterian. Let me put this another way. Although they did not real the, read the whole canon of his verse, in the 40 years after his death, a substantial quantity of Southall's work had a huge and appreciative readership amongst English-speaking Protestants. This is simple fact, as I've said. Very few verse collections went into as many editions. It seems to me that this fact complicates, enriches and negates whole sways of accepted literary history. Considerable doubt is cast on large retrospective assertions about confessional style. The facts cast out also on the prevailing narrative of the ways in which wider influences from Baroque Europe came into English writing from the late 16th century onwards. Equally, these facts seem to me to negate an illogical view, but one very persistently held since the early 20th century, that it was somehow impossible that a large number of British Protestants could have read, known, loved, internalised and imitated verses by a Jesuit mission, Jesuit mission priest. Quite simply, they did. The influence is so persuasive that I will adduce but two examples out of many possibilities 
George Herbert, and perhaps unexpectedly, the Cavalier Marquis of Montrose. The kinship between Southern and Herbert emerges as an intense and close one when it is studied in detail, not least in the very similar ways in which both poets translate the devices of profane poetry to the service of religious devotion, Sellers and Shell. This is most readily apparent in the quatrain poems of both poets, with their simplicity of diction and rich hinterland of thought and devotion. To take the first pairing that comes to mind, if we consider the straightforward personifications... Hang on, something has slightly slipped because of, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to just slightly re, re, retrace and here we are. Um, just skip over. Here we are. Um, yeah. um, if we could take the straightforward personifications and paradoxes of Southall's content and rich, here we are on the slide, I dwell in Grace's court, enriched with virtue's rights. Faith guides my wit, love leads my will, hope all my mind delights. In lowly vales I mount, to pleasure's highest pitch. My seely shroud true honour brings, my poor estate is rich. And then this echoes across so strongly to Herbert's The Elixir. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold, for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. And indeed strong resemblances might be found also with the joyful paradoxes and lucid versification of Herbert's The Submission. How know I, if thou shouldst me raise, that I should then raise thee? Perhaps great places and thy praise do not so well agree. Wherefore unto my gift I stand, I will no more advise. Only do thou lend me a hand, since thou hast both mine eyes. Concern, considering Southerl as an exemplum and source for Herbert, it seems that a substantial number of Herbert's poems on sin and repentance arise from Herbert's absolute immersion in the last part of St Peter's Complaint. Whilst Herbert is, of course, a transformative poet, the degree of involvement with Southall's text is close to that of the immersion of Simeon Graham. One example will have to stand for many possibilities, and this is one observed by Herbert's mid-20th century editor, F.C. Hutchinson, who pointed out the striking parallel with one of Herbert's greatest achievements, the dialogue lyric The Third entitled Love, which concludes Herbert's The Church. So let us first have Southall's St. Peter. At sorrow's door I knocked. They craved my name. I answered one unworthy to be known. What one, say they, one worthiest of blame, but who, a wretch not God's nor yet his own, a man, oh no, a beast, much worse. And then appreciate the remarkable parallel in Herbert's dialogue poem. But quick-eyed love, observing me grew slack, from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest I answered worthy to be here, love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind and grateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I. Arts wrote of this conjuncture of Herbert's love, it has been said, that no poem better represents the way that Herbert assimilates and modified Dunn's style. But in a sense, would it not be more accurate to say that this poem represents the way in which Herbert assimilated and modified Southall's style? Of course, a whole lecture could follow here on the subject of tears in early modern sacred and indeed political poetry. The tears of Southall's St Peter's Complaint and Mary Magdalene's funeral tears flow copiously through the mainstream of 17th century English poetry. Herbert, the much maligned Crashaw, Andrew Marvel. It is with an unexpected tears poem that I'd like to conclude this part of our exploration. Among the small number of passionately felt poems and songs which were attributed in an early 18th century Scottish miscellany to the, Scottish, to the Stuart loyalist aristocrat and military commander of the 1640s, James Graham, Marquis of Montrose, is a remarkable set of lines supposed to have been written on the death of Charles I. Burst out my soul in main of tears, 
and thou my heart sighs tempest move. My tongue let never plaints forbear, but murmur still my crossed love. Combine together all in one, and thunder forth my tragic moan. Which is, of course, a reworking of the opening of Southall St Peter's Complaint, and of its su subsequent imagery of storm and shipwreck and a hopeless voyage. Launch forth my soul into a main of tears, full fraught with grief the traffic of thy mind. Torn sails will serve, thoughts rent with guilty fears. Give care the stern, use sighs in lieu of wind. Remorse thy pilot, thy misdeed the card. Torment thy haven, shipwreck thy best reward. Now we know this influence to be real. In the Inner Periphery Library in Perthshire, perhaps the only serious historical library in Britain to be approached down a rutted farm track, is the small Octavo Edinburgh edition of Southall's Poems. Uh, it's on the top right, shelf E, volume 11. And there on its flyleaf, indeed, is the vaunting Latin motto, Citatio Silabitur Orbis, with which Montrose marked his ownership of his books. Here's a very nice, angry marble cupid from the Jesu. Now, I'm not going to emphasise further this fact of Southall's vast popularity, nor further expand his influence on Protestant writers. But I would like, in conclusion, to consider the strange case of his disappearance, nearly, from the canon and from much literary history. Perhaps a majority of scholars are still influenced by literary historiography which developed through the confessional tensions of the 19th century. And this historiography found written form just as English literature emerged as a university subject in England in the 1920s. This historiography is perhaps unduly influenced by nationalist agendas, and by the religious controversies of the 19th century in England, including perhaps the hostile pronouncements of Leo XIII against the Church of England, which filled the old card catalogue of the Vatican Library with such titles as the Pseudo-Archbishop of Canterbury or a man who calls himself the Dean of Durham. In this context, I can't resist in quoting what you might call a worst-case view of the Society of Jesus, which emerged from the most liberal circles of mid-19th century Oxford and England in the person of Arthur Hugh Clough. Now, admittedly, this passage of chateau-bottled vitriol is one which Clough puts in the mouth of the not wholly sensible aesthete Claude in his 1849 verse novel Amour de Voyage, but it is astonishing enough that he set it on paper at all. He speaks of the Society of Jesus. These that fanaticised Europe, which now can forget them, release not. This their choicest of prey, this Italy. Here you see them here with emasculate pupils and gimcrack churches of Jesu, pseudo-learning and lies. More than enough to give a flavour of the whole passage. But strangely, Eustace's or Clough's revulsion from international Baroque learning and devotion is echoed in more temperate terms, perhaps, by one of the most influential critics of English literature of the early 20th century, H.C. Grierson, the critic who seems to have brought the insular and not always helpful phrase metaphysical poets into common use. In Grierson's Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the 17th Century, published by AUP in 1921, his dismissal of Southall is ingenious, if not wholly logical. Southall is simply removed from the history of English literature for being hectic, for being overwrought emotionally, and for having been educated abroad. In short, he is dismissed, his influence undiscussed, for being insufficiently English. Catholic poets, on the other hand, like Robert Southall, learned from the Italians to write on religious themes in the antithetic, conceited, passionating style of the love poets of the day. His Tears of St Peter is not demonstrably sorry, indebted to Tansilo's Le Lagrime di San Pietro, is composed in the same hectic strain and with a superabundance of the conceits and antitheses of that and other Italian religious poems of the 16th century. So if any doubt lingers that Grierson's agenda is confessional and nationalistic, 
we only need, need really to consider a few sentences from his dismissal of Southall's poetic heir, the unfortunate Richard Crashaw. Crashaw's long odes give the impression at first reading of soaring rockets scattering balls of coloured fire, happy fireworks. His conceits are more after the confectionery manner of the Italians than the scholastic or homely manner of the followers of Dunn. Neither spiritual contract controlled and directed by Christian inhibitions and aspirations, nor mystical yearning for a closer communion with the divine is the burden of his religious song, but only love, tenderness and joy. In Crashaw's poetry a note is heard, the accent of the convert to Romanism. The Catholic poet is set free from the diagnosis of his own emotions, of his own spiritual condition. Um, this rather perverse argument was advanced at a fatal moment of canon formation, at a moment when all credit for cosmopolitan literary innovation in early modern England was given by Grierson to Dunn. Effectively, of the two peaks of the English lyric Renaissance Parnassus, Dunn and Southall, one was simply removed from sight. To a considerable extent, that has remained the case, despite the reasoned and thoughtful advocacy of Oxford's late Professor of Poetry, Sir Geoffrey Hill, who wrote of Southall's clarity of thought in his prose works, in the essay, The Absolute Reasonableness of Robert Southall, which he first published in 1984. But as early as 1978, he published his meditations in verse on the spiritual history of England in a volume called Tenebrae, containing a sequence of sonnets, lacrimae or tears, in tribute to Southall, and in tribute to the hidden stream of poetic consonants, which joins the Jesuit poet and martyr of the 16th century to the scholar poet of the late 20th. So here to end is Hill's Lacrimae Amantis, a faithful and true after echo of St. Peter's complaint at a distance of nearly four centuries. What is there in my heart that you should sue so fiercely for its love? What kind of care brings you as though a stranger to my door? Through the long night and in the icy dew, seeking the heart that will not harbour you, but keeps itself religiously secure. At this dark solstice filled with frost and fire, your passion's ancient wounds must bleed anew. So many nights the angel of my house has fed such urgent comfort through a dream. Whispered, your Lord is coming, he is close, that I have drowsed half faithful for a time, bathed in poor tones of promise and remorse. Tomorrow I shall wake to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. You've given us a lot to meditate on, I think. Uh, a very rich um, narrative uh, full of uh, things to reflect on. One thing that's striking me is this sort of history of reception and non-reception and the the generosity, the openness, the magnanimity, if you like, of uh, Anglican readers who found something in this Jesuit martyr that fed their souls, fed their hearts, fed, fed their own imaginations. And uh, alongside the more sorry story of those who were closed to, to what Saul had to offer. Um, we have... Um, an audience here are very, uh, whose interests very much cross over with this period in different, in different ways. So perhaps to begin with, if I uh, open up to questions here, and then if you're online, please do enter your questions online and we'll get to you uh, very shortly. Noel, and if you'd wait for the microphone to arrive, then uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, for a marvellous talk. Um, probably a rather obvious and elementary question, but in the body of poetry that was so frequently 
reprinted and obviously bought and read by um, English you know, Protestant readers. How, to what extent does that body of poetry contain themes and statements that are so specifically Catholic that they would be regarded as theologically wrong by a, a, a Protestant of that period? I, and how, how, and if so, how openly so? That's a terrific question, and you know, one that I had to ask myself very, very seriously at the beginning of this work. More or less, if we set aside retrospective and artificial distinctions of confessional style, most of what is in those licensed London editions is scriptural in basis, consolatory and edificatory in tone, in many ways confessionally neutral in terms of the time. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, within a cross-confessional use of, say, Ignatian meditation, whereby Constantine Herchen's the Stadthouder's secretary in Calvinist Holland, beyond any doubt, made the Ignatian meditations and wrote a sequence of poems called Heilige Dachen, which are Ignatian meditation poems, composition of place, everything. So I think the answer is it's a careful selection. There's nothing, there are no alarm bells in that section, selection, and that is the one that went into 18 editions. Though it's interesting that retrospectively, St. Peter's complaint is disowned as in an effective and emotive manner that nobody English could possibly accept. Whereas obviously it was very nourishing and very acceptable to contemporary English readers. But I would say that in a curious way, that's such a tightrope that Grierson and Co. can construct for themselves because actually Perhaps a text that I didn't quote, um, The End of John Donne's Death's Jewel, which is one of the most physically affective pieces of writing in early modern English. So a, a terrific question for which my thanks. And it is a careful, it's a careful volume, which makes the attempt of Maonier to fly in plain sight kind of in its shadow, audacious and quite clever. And the implication that that most Catholic and combative volume is in some way licensed as a supplement to this rather careful selection is part of the strategy it uses to try and pass into London circulation. Thank you. I suppose that it's, it's a lot more difficult with poetry to um, edit out the unacceptable bits but uh, I think I, I remember that the, the most modern edition of Southall's Short Rule of a Good Life is actually based on a, uh, an Anglican version in which some of the, uh, the more explicitly Catholic bits are glossed over or edited out or, or so on. So with the prose, with Absolutely. some of his prose works, he was able to, you know, the uh, editors were able to make it more acceptable, but with the with the poetry, they had to choose, I suppose. Yeah, and I think you know the the Marian and Eucharistic poems are all in the volume mm -hmm. that is on the London market only, kind of slightly under false colours. Yeah. Um, that yes, I, I think that's that's exactly, and that the prose was incredibly popular with all confessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the adaptations are very often, as you say, quite quite modest ones. Mm. Mm. Any more questions from here in the library? Henry. Thank you. Do I have a message? Yes. Thank you very, thank you very much, Peter, for a wonderful talk. I, I enjoyed it a great deal. I, I was wondering whether, in your your work on on the edition, looking at um, individual copies of um, these uh, uh, twenty three, I think you said edi early editions of Subtle, whether you found them uh, among them um, uh, decorated and customized copies with um, piety artistic um, elements in them, either engravings or, or bindings, and, and, and thinking about that beautiful um, cope, uh, uh, chasuble, um, whether, whether there were any, any examples of um, uh, fabric bindings on them. 
Alas, no, though. I mean, it's a wonderful question, and there are enriched copies, copies that are bound up with bits of manuscript, copies that are bound up with bits of manuscript thought to be in Savile's hand, you know, quasi relics. And there's a wonderful thing in the Huntington, which is a kind of Samuel band of all kinds of Southwellian material, which looks quite closely related. I mean, it's almost Grangerized, you might say. Fabric bindings look to have been possibly removed because unfortunately the green collection, which would have been, you know, the actual autograph of St. Peter's complaint I showed, that, 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 that's in a nice workaday Lancashire 19th century binding, which was obviously part of an early 19th century tidy up. But that is exactly the, those small stitch pamphlets are what I would have thought would be absolute candidates, as you say. And there are other things at Stonyhurst where writings of a, of a particular culted individual have, have decorated and enriched bindings. So, yes, I mean, in terms of grandeurizing and in terms of making these extraordinary kind of anthologies of prose and verse, um, very often sort of supplementing in manuscript on fly leaves. So all those things, though, alas, I would, I would bet that you're right, there were embroidered bindings, but they have gone. I mean, I, 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 I think partly blaming Napoleon and just partly blaming 19th century pragmatism. <laughs> One interesting question here is to do, I think, with the relationship between the, the spiritual exercises and what you described as Suttles' visual, effective, meditative poetry. Um, Terence O'Reilly has recently shown quite convincingly, I think, that the old image of Ignatius as the archetypal anti-Lutheran is a completely mistaken picture and that in the 1520s and 30s, <coughs> Ignatius's main concern was not to oppose the heretics, but to avoid being classed as a heretic himself. Mm. And uh, that, in the spiritual exercise, is very scriptural, based on, on the cross, on meditation, on uh, you know, desire for compunction for sin. Uh, these things are acceptable across confessional boundaries. Um, so I, I suppose what I'm wondering is to what extent is it not just that the exercises lead into Southall's own process of writing poetry, but to what extent is Southall hoping to draw his readers into that kind of meditative engagement with, with Christ, with the, the saints, with scripture? And so on? I, I, I think just absolutely. But I think a lot of the work is, is done already by lightly deconfessionalized versions of meditative texts based on Ignatius, which really are spread throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. And that the use of emblemata of a kind that one might think of as quite Jesuit is actually also quite nonconformist. And that there is this is this is in a sense what you've just enriched what I was touching on towards the end, this making of artificial distinctions in retrospect. That actually you know I'm thinking also of my, my wife's work on English works translated abroad, that they're so often what we think of as Catholic devotional works have a tremendous sale in Protestant countries. Mm. And that I think there is much more fluidity and much more use of meditation mm. across. And yet, you know, it's odd because much of this is in Louis Marx and it's just never quite stuck. Mm. <laughs> you know, that sometimes people publish something really very considered and it doesn't become part of the accepted wisdom. Yeah. But I think it's absolutely the case. And it, it makes the history all, all the more interesting and yeah. worthy of further exploration, these, these different influences and cross-currents. I remember yeah. sitting in Leiden uh, 35 years ago, reading Constantine Hachens' Heilige Dachen. Ignatius, Ignatius, Ignatius. <laughs> and then it's the point where he says... You know, and then consider the straw in the stable and what's the next line in Hawkins? <laughs> you know, <laughs> make yourself the little servant who stands at the stable. And so I was thinking, you know, what, what is the effectively prime minister of the most successful Calvinist country in Europe? Of course, he's just, he is doing these meditations as almost everybody did. 
I think the absolute best-selling book, it's always con controversial, but you know, there's a Jesuit meditation, um, Drexel, is almost the best-selling book of Renaissance Europe. Printed everywhere. Yeah. Good, we have another couple of questions and then we'll see if there's any from, uh, from online. Uh, John. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. I, I was very interested in the, of course, I'm an Anglican, I was very interested in the influence on writers like Herbert. But I wonder if you could say any more about the reception in Scotland, in the Church of Scotland, where, you know, on the face of it, one would expect perhaps less sympathy than you get um, south of the border. I don't know. Is it's extraordinary wrong? because, really, without exaggerating, so very little is printed in Edinburgh. You know, by and large, the Scottish habit is to get your books from the continent. But, I mean, that's not a flip thing to say. I mean, that's based on thinking about the Lindsay Libraries quite seriously. But Southall runs to two editions. And, you know, it's so unusual for Scots to read in the vernacular because the language of Scottish recreational reading is almost inevitably Latin. I mean, there's almost nothing translated into Scottish English after Gavin Douglas. I mean, things are translated, they're just published in Latin for the Scottish market. Um, and at a time when nearly all Scottish literary activity is in Latin, that two editions of an English verse book should, should command an Edinburgh sale suggests a really warm reception for Southern in, in, in London, Scotland. I mean, there's the question of this sort of rather more cosmopolitan and confessionally fluid Aberdeen. I mean, those songbooks are fascinating things, and actually Forbes, the publisher, was himself a very accomplished spiritual poet. And, I mean, it's a volume hardly known because it only survives in one copy. But um, I think that a vernacular work should go into two editions in Scotland. You know, you're in the kind of popularity of something like Dubatas. And this argues that, that Southall really did command a, a tremendous readership by the standard, modest standards of the day in, in, in the Scotland of the early 17th century. Thank you, uh, Gerard, and then we'll uh, see what questions. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk, and uh, visually exciting as well. Um, I was just wondering when you were comparing Southall with Dunn uh, about the manuscript tradition, and you mentioned the wonderful manuscript English poet B5, uh, and which shows that um, Southall is being transcribed within a devotional and sort of hymnic tradition uh, 75 years on, and how that compares with the, the transmission in manuscript of, of Dunn. I mean, we know there were thousands of individual copies of, of Dunn, but what was happening by 1657 when that manuscript of, of Southall I, appeared? I think as Dunn rises, Southall is, is fading. I've said comparatively little about Dunn this evening being in the presence of the expert, but I, I think that Southall continues to circulate into the mid-century, because I, I think English poet B5 is late 50s on internal evidence. It's certainly Southall seems to continue to circulate in that kind of Staffordshire, Louvain, Tixall, Thimbleby, that, that sort of grouping of people. Um, he, se he seems to be in the commonplace books of that group of people who start in their young youth as kind of Spanish match, diplomatic, Queen's Court Catholics. Um, but I think as Don rises and rises, and is also translated, um, there seems to be a bit of activity. I'm just beginning to find out a bit about some Paris manuscripts. seems to be a bit of Latin activity around Southall in the mid-century, but really Dunn is rising in the vernacular like a star as Southern is, is going quiet into more Catholic circles, of course into popular song like Mary Magdalene's Complaint. So I think rise, what the one rises as the other goes quiet. Good. Carl, would you like to uh, pose a question from our online viewers? Thank you, Professor Davidson, for your 
lecture we have received several questions and I have to choose two of them. Someone is asking, how was the work of Subtle received, if at all, on the continent? And another person is asking, could you outline the difference between Subtle's printed texts and his manuscript tradition in terms of extent and number of texts? Certainly, I'll take the second one first, if I may, and then you might just you know, remind me of the terms of the first question. Um, the it's pretty well a complete works in English that is circulated in the Jesuit family of manuscripts and virtually everything that appears in print is from within that collection. There's very few outliers. Those outliers are mostly things he wrote before he left Rome for England. So there's the poem on the Assumption. There's a couple of little sort of rather personal meditative poems. There are some notes that are not atypical for a Jesuit student of the day. Um, so those don't really travel into the main corpus. The Latin poems seem to travel in a different circuit from the English poems. Maybe talk about that later, but to answer the very good question at once, what's printed is as we were talking about earlier, what's printed in London is a fairly safe, confessionally neutral grouping. That um, Myonia is an explicitly Catholic grouping from the Catholic manuscript tradition. Um, what is published on the continent, mostly by John Wilson at Saint-Omer, is from, again, the same Catholic manuscript tradition. So I think you probably have a kind of central repertory in the hands of the Jesuits, copied in manuscript and forming the basis of the priest's songbook that then goes to somewhere near Bristol and turns into Bodley and English Poet B5. And then the printed editions tend to generate the other printed editions. Um, the Gordon Castle manuscript seems to be copied from a continental Catholic printed edition. That's a very rough answer. Um, the poem on Mary Queen of Scots is a strange one because that, of course, is a police matter. And so we do have a secret police copy of it now in the library at Lambeth Palace, which was seized on the street several days after her execution. But Quite a complex question. Carl, Carl, if you could just remind me of the, the terms of the other very good question. So the first person was asking, but you have already started answering this question, how was the work of Subtle received, if at all, on the continent? It's quite hard to tell. Um, I mean, compared to the obvious, you know, triumphant sweeping of Europe by Joseph Simmons, performed all over the place, the way that Campion in, himself has performed at the Imperial Court. Um, he seems to have a quiet manuscript life. There are translations of the prose devotions. There are no translations, unlike Dunn. There are no vernacular translations of the verse that I've ever come across. Though I've just been adverted to what looks like a Latin translation of one of his English poems in a Paris Carthusian manuscript of the 50s. So there is a rough answer, less less of a verse presence and certainly, you know, no translation vernacular to vernacular as would be the case with Dan. Thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, we're drawing to an end uh, of our time for this, this conversation. So uh, thank you very much, Peter, for Pleasure. sharing Great so pleasure. much of... Um, uh, this story, this fascinating story about Sutherland uh, from your, your research over the years. And we'll look very much forward to how the, the project of his complete works unfolds. Meantime, uh, uh, the best edition of Sutherland's poetry is, is edited by Peter. So uh, please do have a look at that um, and, and order a copy. And I think all of us are going to enthusiastically return to Southall's poetry with, with a, new, uh, a new eye, shall we say. Oh, so thank so you much. very much. Thank that. you all so much. So thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening. And do keep in touch with, uh, with future events, future Campion lectures. In Trinity term, we have the Darcy lectures by...
Father James Keenan, who will be unfolding uh, moral theology for us, a series of eight lectures. So that promises to be very exciting and will be live streamed as well as in person. So do join us for that. Have a good evening, everyone.